because the Jewish people are already showing we us leave the Jewish people alone. how to. Uh, I ain't gonna you been going way too far. No, I am the visionary. I can end war. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts. My name is Spidey, and I use my degree in sociology and psychology, my certifications in criminal interrogation and body language analysis, and over 10 years as an award winning mentalist to teach people behavioral analysis and practical psychology on stages and television shows all over the world. This week, we are looking at rapper, singer, songwriter, music producer, fashion designer, Kim Kardashian's ex, Ye, formerly known as Kanye West who recently did an interview on a podcast called Drink Champs. Now the interview was taken down shortly after because the producers and the hosts felt that he said some extremely inappropriate things and they just didn't want to put that out there. Also, the hosts took a lot of heat for just letting him talk about these things. And we're going to talk a lot about that because I actually think that the hosts did a couple of really incredible things that we rarely see in this kind of interview. So I think, you know, we do have to look at that from both ends, but overall, the body language. What does it suggest? The word choice, the body language, the facial expressions. Does Ye believe in these things that he's saying or is he just saying it to get a rise out of people? Now before we look at these clips and look at his behaviors, I do want to say this. I very much changed the direction of this video once the main interview was taken down because I have a lot of respect for the interviewers Nori and DJ EFN. And I do think that there are parts of this where they did a fantastic job. And we're going to look at those parts and I'll tell you why. But shortly after Nori went on some interviews and he said that he regrets the way he handled this and he regrets allowing Ye to say certain things that he should have stepped in with. And out of respect for him, I'm going to remove those statements. So basically, I'm going to remove the really triggering things and the really inappropriate things that he said. I'll leave some articles in the description where you can go catch up on those things and read up about the things he said. Besides, what I do is behavioral analysis and there's a lot of other clips where we're seeing things in his body language, his statements, his facial expressions. Now that being said, those statements were like a 15 on 10. There are still a couple of things he says that are a solid 8 or 9 on 10 and they're still here because they're part of a conversation where I'm getting a lot of information and I want you guys to see it and see what, what you're feeling with those. So let's dive right in, starting with something he said right in the beginning where for me, something wasn't adding up. Here it is. And what they do is the Jewish community, especially in the music industry, they'll take, in the entertainment period, they'll take one of us, the brightest of us, right, that can really feed a whole village and they'll take us and milk us till we die and then Stevie Wonder's son got to get a job, mm. right? But Camera Azoff got a job at Apple. He, I right. mean, he, he's already set up right. because of the way Azoff is connected. All right, so right there he's talking about how certain individuals in the music industry will take talented members of the black community and exploit their talent for profit, but then the children of those artists are not better off for it. And the example he provides is that Stevie Wonder, who was an incredible artist, his son is now out there looking for work, looking for a job. So his dad's success didn't really make the situation better for the whole family. But there's something really interesting happening with his body language, more specifically with his illustrators. Illustrators are the gestures we use to emphasize what we're saying. And they normally not only match the timing of our words, but the mood of our words as well. So whenever we see gestures that go upwards or are high up in general, we call these gravity defying gestures and they're normally associated with happiness and positivity. Because think about it, when we're happy or positive, things go upwards. When we're sad or negative, things tend to go down. Even in the way we speak about things, we jump for joy, we party up but we settle down. When we're depressed, we might say we're feeling down or someone is feeling down and we all know what that means. It's almost instinctual, this binary between up and down. So I want you to notice when he's talking about, at first, how they will take talented artists and they will milk us till we die. All his illustrators are down here and not only the illustrators, but the tone as well. Listen to the tone, go back to it, listen to it again. He's down here, as he's talking about it, it's a low register and his gestures are all down here on his left and he's talking down here and they'll milk us till we die. But when he starts to talk about Cameron Azoff, who's the son of a very rich gentleman from the Jewish community, there's an instant shift. 
First, his tone. He goes from that low tone instantly to a higher tone. Camera A's off. We, we, we hear that shift and his gestures go up. And now he's talking over here and how he gets a job at Apple automatically and his tone is higher up. Everything goes up with that shift. So when I first watched this interview, that was really weird to me because he's talking about something dark and he's talking about a community that he says some very inappropriate things about. But when he talks about in this specific moment, that example, we see his body language and tone go to positive. And for me, that didn't make sense. Why isn't he staying in that negative? Why isn't he being condescending towards this idea that apparently bothers him? So I was looking at that going, no, why, why is there that shift? And I wouldn't get my answer for another hour and a half because it took an hour and a little less, an hour and 20 minutes in this interview for him to say the lines, say the words that explain why this shift happened. And we're gonna look at that a little bit later. We're gonna understand why he shifted to positive in this moment. There's something else happening in that clip that is very common for Ye. And it gives us huge insight as to how he thinks and how he communicates and also explains very much why a lot of people in the media have a hard time following him on these rants. And it's when he talks about the comparison, he goes, Stevie Wonder's son is doing this and then Cameron Azoff is doing such and such. Now, when he says that, we hear the host, Nori, just saying, right, right. But it's not a strong agreement. So Nori doesn't know who Cameron Azoff is. In fact, later, we're gonna see a clip where the Azoff family comes up again and Nori confirms that he has no clue that is. He flat out says, that he doesn't know who Irving Azoff is, Cameron's father. In fact, I would assume that a lot of people don't know who Cameron Azoff is. I'm not saying nobody would know the Azoffs. They are a very prominent family. They're closely connected to the Kardashians. So you may have heard the name, but I'm assuming that a lot of people don't know who Irving, more specifically his son, Cameron is. Actually, let me know in the comments. Before he said Cameron Azoff, did you know who that is? Or when he said it, did you go like, I, I don't know who that is, who's he talking about? But that's my whole point. Ye often does this. He often drops these things in the conversations, references, he talks about someone or an event. And logically, most of us would know that that's the kind of thing that you need to explain a little bit more, take a sentence or two to kind of explain what that is, give it context, but he doesn't. He just says one thing and another thing and an event and he drops a name and he does this a lot in this interview to where even the hosts get lost and they're like just kind of agreeing along. And people who do that often seem like they don't have their thoughts together because they're not empathizing with their audience in order to say, oh, by the way, uh, Cameron Azoff is the son of a very successful Jewish person and he recently got a job at Apple at the age of 21. Like he doesn't explain that thought process. So we're listening and going, what, what do you, what do you, who is that? What are you talking about? What are you saying? This kind of behavior is something we often see in narcissistic people. They believe that because they understand the context and they know what's going on in their head that we all do. He doesn't stop for a second to put himself in the shoes of the person he's talking to, to go, right, you know, I know who this person is because I've worked very closely with him, but, but these people may not, so I may need to explain that a little bit more. And I think that that explains a lot of the way Ye speaks. I think that there are certain things in his head that make sense to him or in the way that he's saying it because there's information, there's context there that he's not communicating, but he just kind of assumes that everyone gets what's going on in his head, but we don't. So he'll say things that make you go, D did he just say that? But in his head, there's a whole bunch of things that he's not communicating. We're gonna see a lot of examples of that coming up. By the way, really quick, I think this is a good place to throw in my usual disclaimer. Uh, it is not my goal to attack or defend Kanye. On the one hand, he's an extremely successful musical artist, fashion designer, but on the other hand, I, I despise some of the stuff he said, and I think it's highly inappropriate. And I personally, if you ask me personally, I think he's just lost his way. But it is not my goal to either prove or disprove that. It is my goal to look at his methods of communication to try to see what's going on emotionally or what's going on in his head. And that's all it is. So if at any point, you see something that makes you wanna go, how dare you defend him? Or, oh, you're just interested in attacking him. I'm really not interested in either of those things. And if ever I say something that sounds like I might be, uh, I'm sorry, it's just really not the intention. I told y'all I was the leader. I told y'all I'm gonna free my people mm -hmm. in the name of God, and I will put my life at risk. Okay, so just a quick clip there to once again give us insight as to 
what happens in his head, how he thinks about himself. And this is a classic example, those words are perfect, of the Messiah complex. So the Messiah complex, it's not a disorder, it's a state of mind that we study in social psychology that is associated with people who believe that they have this role, often a divine role, but not always, to be the savior. The savior of the world, the savior of their people, the savior of a, a certain subset, but they are a savior. Saving a certain demographic falls on their shoulders. Now once again, Messiah complex is not a diagnosable disorder, it's more of a state of mind. And if we want to get more technical about it, I guess the closest thing that would be, would be part of a disorder would be delusions of grandeur, which again isn't a disorder, but it's a symptom of certain disorders. Delusion of grandeur is someone who in their head has delusions that they are a lot more successful, much wealthier, much better than they actually are, and it's very closely related to narcissistic personality disorder. So narcissists often, not always, have these delusions in their head, actual delusions where they're convinced that their life is a lot more grand than it actually is. So there's a really interesting conversation for the comments. I know there are a lot of psychologists, psychiatrists, and mental health workers who are part of this community. I'd love to hear from you. So let us know in the comments, uh, and you could tell us what your experience is. Do you think, from what you're seeing here, that there are signs here of narcissistic personality disorder? Of course, I know you can't diagnose because you haven't had a chance to examine, uh, yay. But do you think that there's signs of that? Uh, do you think there's signs of delusions of grandeur? Uh, or is it simply just Messiah Complex, a guy who really thinks highly of himself, maybe super arrogant? Which one is it? What do you think? Let me know in the comments. All right, now we're going to move on to some other clips that are going to allow us to figure out why he says the things he says. But before we do, do me a huge favor. If you're enjoying this video, hit that like button. It really does help get it out there. Hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavioral analysis content. You know what I'm saying? It's because we, like me and Cos, would be in a studio and we would make songs and be like, yo, we want to make mad. We want to make mad with the music. Like, it was like, if it don't hurt, like if it don't, it's, it's, it can't just compete, it has to hurt. Mm -hmm. We not just, that's the reason why I'm not washed, because mm -hmm. I still make it hurt, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, and then it comes out and it hurt and people be hurt about it, and then I be halfway acting like I don't know why they hurt. Mm. They hurt because you hurt them. This mm. hurts. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Sleeping in a stadium hurts. Yeah. All like, you know, throwing Balenciaga couture on the floor, it hurts. Like okay, that is a beautiful little segment. It's one of three segments that really, he verbalizes what he's trying to do and explains why he is the way he is. So he's talking about how when he's making music, he tries to make it hurt. Let's go back to those illustrators. By the way, I love to look at the illustrators on musical artists because you'll notice rappers very often as they rap, they use their hands to illustrate. It changes the mood of their rap. When there's happier moments, they do different gestures. And when there's more intense moments, you see different gestures. So they get very used to using those hands to illustrate what they're saying. Over here, I find it really interesting that originally when he talks about the concept of hurt, he does a gesture and then he keeps talking. Then when he says hurt again, we see that exact same gesture and it's this. He goes, it has to hurt. And he does this twice. Then he talks a little bit more. We see his gesture putting things down you know, on the table like this is my goal. Then he goes right back to you have to make it hurt. And he goes like this, this twisting motion. And I thought long and hard about what he means by hurt. You have to make it hurt. Because the obvious interpretation would be he's saying that he wants to hurt people. With his lyrics, with his gestures, with his actions, he wants to hurt people. And you look at that and you go, whoa, why, why does he want to hurt people? That's, that's an awful thing to say. But then at the end, he gives something that goes, wait, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. At the end, he goes, sleeping in a stadium hurts. Throwing Balenciaga couture on the floor hurts. And I listen to that and I go, no, it doesn't. Now, once again, because Ye tends to not explain his references and what he's talking about because he just assumes everyone knows what he knows. And maybe, maybe everyone does know this. Maybe most of you know this. But in case you don't, the reference to the stadium is the fact that for a while, he was actually living in this tiny little room at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta while completing a project that he was working on. He was actually living under the stadium. So think about it. He goes on this really long speech about making it hurt. And people, you know, people are hurt and they wonder why you hurt because you hurt them. So he's saying all these things like, I try to hurt people. And then he goes, Sleeping in a stadium hurts, but who does it hurt? It doesn't, it doesn't hurt us. Maybe it hurts him because it's uncomfortable, but 
it doesn't hurt us. So what I think is happening here is hurt is, is, is not exactly the word he means. I think he means impact, shock. That would make a lot more sense because he's saying we think about ways to shock people, to impact people, to hit them hard with shock. And if you look at it under that light, yes, sleeping under a stadium impacted. It hit. It may not have hurt, but it hit because everyone was like, what is he doing? Why is he sleeping under a stadium? Why is he throwing the Balenciaga Couture all over the floor? So he's giving us insight here as to how he thinks. And, and he even says at some point that he goes, it hurt because you hurt them. Like, that's my goal. I try to make that impact on purpose. And now we go back to that illustrator where he goes, make it hurt. And think about this gesture. It's not we make it hurt. It's we make it hurt. It's almost like a twist, like an irritating kind of nudge type gesture. So I think that's exactly what's going on here. I think hurt may be the wrong word when he means impact. You hit them, you impact them, you shock them, not hurt. It's illegal to collect rainwater in America. What? Illegal? It's illegal? It's illegal to co collect rainwater you in America. Other country. Okay, how many of you have the urge to run to Google right now? Don't worry about it, I did it for you. Uh, some of you may know, some of you may be informed about this, but for me when I heard that I was like, that doesn't make, that doesn't make too much sense to me. Uh, but maybe, I don't know, maybe he's saying it with such conviction, it must be true. And this is the thing, throughout this interview, he says numerous times, not just once, that information and intelligence is our most important asset as the human race. Okay, so what I'm saying is information is the most important resource to our species mm. above water. It's not even information, it's intelligence, mm. right? I think, yeah, intelligence and information are extremely important things to protect and preach and spread. So I looked it up and no, uh, it's not illegal to harvest rainwater in America. Now, to be fair, it's not a completely unfounded statement. Uh, I found some links. I'll leave them all in the description. And if you know different, please let me know in the comments. But there's one that's really specific state by state. And in some states, there are some restrictions as to what you can do with that water. Like, you're not supposed to drink it. And then there's other states that have some restrictions. But in a vast majority of cases, in most states, it is absolutely not illegal to harvest rainwater. And that's where I have a problem with this. If you're gonna make the statement that information is the most important thing that we have as a human race, then be informed. You can't, and th that contrast is very obvious to me because on the one hand he says information is important, then he just drops things like this, random things that are unfounded, or he says things and kind of shifts his thinking. And I kind of feel like once again he's saying, we all need to be informed, but I don't need to be, because what I say is gospel. It goes back to that Messiah complex. What I say is, is truth. The things I know are true. So he's not applying the things he's saying to himself. It all connects somehow. And I still be in my head like, you know, maybe, you know, maybe one day our family could get back together. You know, like Shelly Azoff left Irvin twice. Shelly left twice. Oh, what's about? Irvin Magic Johnson? No, Irvin Azoff. Oh, I don't even... I, that's know, that's Kim's... That's Kim. <laughs> I'm that, black, black. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. All right, so two things in that one. The first is uh, closing a loop from the beginning. Remember how I said in the beginning that the host, Nori, didn't know who Cameron Azoff was when Kanye brought it up? And he was just kind of, right, right. He was just kind of going along because he had lost him. So this is the evidence of that. So when Ye once again brings up Shelly and Irving Azoff, uh, Nori goes, very clearly indicates that he doesn't know who that is. He thinks he's talking about Magic Johnson and he goes, uh, no, no, and he goes, oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't know who that is. Cause like, I'm, I'm, he goes, I'm black, black. Like, I don't, I, I don't know who those people are at all. But the other thing I wanna look at is some really interesting body language there right in the beginning when he's talking about maybe how one day their family could get back together. This is not the first reference he makes in this interview about him and Kim getting back together. Uh, at the very least in what he says, it seems that there would be interest on his end to reunite with uh, Kim at some point. Family values are very important to him in the way that he speaks about his parents and just overall family values. Uh, he places them very high in his list of priorities. So I think for him, preferably, they would be together. He's quite protective over Kim as well. It's actually sweet to see that. You know, as much as he says things that are completely intolerable, uh, it's sweet to hear him talk about Kim at times. And in this moment in the beginning, 
that body language is, is quite spectacular to the point where I first thought maybe he's looking at his phone or something. But then I kept a really close eye on it. At no point in this interview do we ever see him looking at his phone or feeling distracted or showing any evidence that he's looking at his phone. So in the beginning, we have a very intense version of what we call turtling. Turtling is something we do when we're feeling vulnerable or defensive. Just like a turtle retreats into his or her shell, we do the same because we protect vulnerable areas of our body, right? The neck is very vulnerable. So when we're feeling defensive, your hand might come up like this as you defend your neck, but also you might just do this kind of thing. And that's what we're seeing in the beginning. He's looking down, his cadence slows down, you know, you know, like there's those pauses in there. It's almost sad to hear that. And he goes, maybe one day our, our family could get back together. And there was something there about that body language that to me looked like a punished kid. You know, a kid who's punished and just in like, well, maybe, you know, maybe if I'm good, I can have some ice cream later, that kind of thing. Like there was, there was a vulnerability there. There was an innocence there. And also I feel, I don't know the situation between him and Kim and how close they are. And if they're talking, it might happen. You know, there might be possibilities there. It might already be on the table, but there's also like this kind of big hopefulness there that one day we could get back together and be a great big happy family despite the things he said about the Kardashians, despite the things he says publicly about Chris. Um, there's just this kind of hopefulness there. It's almost like this innocence. Now my thing is like, look, they're, all Jewish people are not bad. Please say that. I just said it. All right. But, <laughs> but I need the ones to step up because up to this point, I can name you 20 nightmare situations. Yeah, but that you can't. That's that's like that's like me going to a projects, right? Mm -hmm. That's like me going to 40 projects and 40 projects and shit happened bad to me. But then I could go to 40 projects in a certain time and the church people walk me right through that same projects and I'm good. It's a project mentality. I'm from Chicago yes. and I have a project mentality. Even yeah. with the intelligence that I have, if I go to somebody block and somebody shoot me, shoot at me, kill one of my homeboys, then it's f they whole block. Now you get it? Yeah. Now you get it? Okay, let's talk about the hosts now. So we have Nori and we have DJ EFN. And I've studied interrogation technique. I've studied interview technique. I've done interview consulting professionally. And they're getting a lot of heat. They're getting a lot of heat because they didn't cut Ye off and say, hey, listen, you can't say these things. Because right now he's talking about, once again, the Jewish community. And I cut out a lot of stuff he said. But for the first hour of the interview, he kept relating every question back to that. And he was saying some enormously disrespectful things. They're not agreeing with him. Right in the beginning of their video, there was a disclaimer saying, we don't agree with what our guests say. But as an interviewer, you have to let them talk. Because here's the thing. There's value to us hearing what Ye thinks and going, oh, come on, that's unacceptable. If they cut him off, if he adjusted his messaging because he saw that his friends weren't on his side, we wouldn't have this information that makes us go, okay, well, some, someone needs to step in and do something about this. But that's not the only reason that I think what they did was helpful. Because here's what happened. Now we're going to start seeing it. In the clip that we just saw and some really major ones coming up, they started chipping away at him and he had a realization. It's coming up and I want you to see it when it happens. He had a realization and the narrative shifted. The net of his position, that condescending position he had, it shifted. And it's specifically because the hosts just let him vent. They just let him, they just listen to him. They let him get it out of his system. And here it's starting, by the way, because when he says that, when he says, not all Jewish people are bad, Look at Nori, look at his face. The moment Ye says that, he goes, please say that. Like there's this affirmative, like we see that tension in the eyebrows, like, like there's anger towards this, but we're seeing that affirmative, like, please say that. It's important for you to say that. Like that's what I'm getting in that sort of, please say that. So, and he goes, I'm saying it. So basically that's Nori going after an hour of just hearing this, finally Ye goes, you know, I don't think they're all bad. And he goes, it's, it's important for you to say that. You have to say that. So finally gets him to say that. Then Nori talks about how this mentality of taking the behaviors of a small group of people and applying it to a community happens within their own community. Like he goes, if I go to a, the projects, 
At one time, it could be a terrible experience, but another time, it could be a great experience. So are you doing that? Are you taking a small sample and applying it to a community? And he gets Ye to question his own position. When he's saying that his mentality is to say F this whole block, when one person from that block is violent towards him or his friends, and he's talking about that and he's thinking about that and he's describing his thought process, he's describing, there's a word for that. It's called prejudice. So when you take the actions of one person and judge an entire community based on the actions of that one person, that's racist, that's sexist, that's homophobic, it's prejudice. And I think what's happening in that moment in his head is he's realizing that these two things can't coexist because his own people that he loves and he protects and he talks about, the ones that he's here to save, they've suffered prejudice for a very long time. And if he's doing the same thing, and I think he's realizing it's hypocritical. So he has to change his angle now. He has to have a different reasoning as to why he's been saying these things about the Jewish community. And we're about to get that. And all that, I think, is because the two hosts let him vent, let that come out, and then slowly started chipping at it. So yeah, you can look at this interview and say, they shouldn't have aired this, or the parts that I didn't include here and say, yeah, they shouldn't have aired this, bad call, you know, they really should have stood up against him. But you also have to consider the benefits of not doing that. Because by accepting, or seemingly accepting, letting him speak and hearing him out, well, he's going to hear them out more when they come in and eventually do interject. And it's starting right now. And you also, said you can't be mad at them because you want to do the same. You know, I, you know what? That's, I, that's I, an important I, thing I to say. I can't be, but I am because I'm jealous because I'm a human being. And you want the same and, for... And I'm a competitor. I want my people to rise up like the Jewish people. I'm a competitor. Touchdown. That's incredible. Like, honestly, what? Like, look, I get it. I get that people are very upset by this interview. I understand it. As I watch it, I had to take breaks. I had to go calm myself down. I had to go hug my cat numerous times. I get it. But can we also just please give credit to DJ EFN and Nori? As, like this moment from DJ EFN was incredible because he says, you can't be mad at them because you said that you want to do the same. So he's highlighting the contrasts in Ye's thinking which he often does. He often says things that contradict each other. And if you highlight it, typically in a lot of other interviews, he redirects, he goes on a different rant, he goes on a different tangent. But here, we're seeing something in his body language that's excessively rare. He's sitting back, and we kind of see that moment of reflection. He takes it in. When it comes to Ye's world, that's massive. It's a leap forward, because he rarely considers what other people are saying, and if he does, he just spins in his favor. But in this case, he comes back, he addresses it, and he goes, you know what? I am mad because I'm jealous. And it took an hour and a half to get there, but flipping that narrative like that is brilliant. There is, from this point in time on, for the rest of the interview, a different perspective when he's talking about the Jewish community. Now, for the first hour and a half, he said some awful things. He deserves to be exposed for that. But from this moment, when, when DJ EFN made him realize that, okay, yeah, you know what? It's jealousy. It's not hate, it's jealousy. How he wants his people to be like the Jewish community. I'm so glad I just watched the playback of this last clip that I filmed because when I talked about the Jewish community, completely involuntarily, I did this. And it reminded me of that gesture in the beginning that I told you for me was, there was a discrepancy there that took an hour and a half for me to understand. Because right in the beginning, as he talked about his people, there was this kind of negative illustrators down here. And then as he talked about Cameron Azoff, he moved up here. And it took an hour and a half to understand, for him to express why I saw this kind of upwards, more positive gesture. Because it's not necessarily condescension, or the intention isn't condescension. The way he expresses it is very condescending, but there was a part of him that envies it, that wants his people to be like the Jewish community. And it took an hour and a half, a lot of patience, a lot of empathy, to get him to this point. Every day for us, if we can remove I and move as a body, that's how 
the Jewish people do because the Jewish people are already showing we gotta us leave the Jewish people alone. How to? I ain't gonna lie, you been going way too far. No, you gotta stop. The Jewish people are my new Drake. Right. No, leave them, leave them out of Drake. But I don't even think it's Jewish people for you. I think it's a certain people that are doing yeah, certain things. I think it was and twenty Drake people. Just, I think it was twenty people who kind of hurt you and you kind of taking it out. On and the they happen to be Jewish. And the thing is, I have did that with like people from like our projects. I have beef with, and then I just <laughs> took it out on the whole project. <laughs> Okay, some really great body language here. And uh, you might be wondering why, you know, Nori said here at this point, like, you, you gotta leave the Jewish people alone, like enough with this, given that we really haven't seen him bring it up that many times. But again, I was very selective with these clips. And for the first hour, he just kept going back on the case of the Jewish community. I think what happened here is finally, finally they got him to admit that it's jealousy. They finally got to just shift his perspective a little bit which with someone like Ye, who's really that into his own opinions and his own position on something, is like climbing Everest. So I think at this point when he goes back to that, Nori's immediately like, okay, enough with this. Like we covered it, we did it. At this point, we're just like, there's nothing left to talk about here. Let's look at his body language. So the moment Ye says, the Jewish people, uh, it, it cuts to Nori and he goes, you, you gotta leave the Jewish people alone. And as he says that, we see what we call in body language looking askance. So he's got his head turned like this and he's looking at him sideways. We also commonly call this side eye, like when you give someone the side eye. So he's looking at him like this off the side. On his mouth, we see a little bit, it's subtle, but we see a little bit of that contempt. So he's looking at him like this, as he's saying, you gotta leave the Jewish people alone. And then twice, we see stop gestures. So his hands come up like this, he goes, you know, that's enough. Like, I gotta be honest with you. And there's, there's also this throwaway gesture. So stop gestures are when our hands, fingers come straight up. So it's not a relaxing like this, which is, which is typically positive. It's more of a shooting up like this. And this happens like when we're startled or we wanna stop something or when we're scared of something. So he's like going like this and he's even throwing it away. Like, I, enough with this topic. I just quickly looked at that clip again and uh, it's interesting because he actually says, you gotta stop. So right after he does that stop gesture, he actually says, you gotta stop. So obviously he's thinking like, enough. Uh, the other interesting thing I saw is, I was saying that on the lips, the, the contempt is subtle, but it's not subtle if you look at the cheek and the eye. We clearly see that, because his, his mouth doesn't go this high up, but if you look at the eye, you could see that one eye is, is like this when he's giving that looking askance. And that often happens because what happens is when that lip comes up, it does this. But somehow with him, we're not seeing it that obviously on the lip, but we are seeing it up here. Now in meetings, I just push into it like on some Sasha Baron Cohen level. That's yeah, I'm anything, not mad at that. I, I, anything I that's, that's on my it, mind, that is, that's I'll genius. say it. Okay, so earlier I said that in this interview, there are a couple of moments that really show me what he's he's thinking, what his thought process is, what he's trying to do. This is one of them. So he says that in these meetings, in his creative meetings, he, uh, he operates on Sasha Baron Cohen's level. And for those of you who don't know, Sasha Baron Cohen is the comedian, uh, actor who plays Borat and Ali G, who does these brilliant sketches or movies that make society look inwards and go, Oh man, we, we can't be we can't be doing things this way. So what he does is that he creates these exaggerated characters that reflect part of his thinking, but again, it's a massive exaggeration that he uses to show society what's wrong with society, or at least from his perspective. So think about that. Think about that metaphor and think about what Ye is saying here. Because if you look at it from that angle, it explains a lot. That it's not necessarily, I don't think it's fake. Um, I think it's a real part of him that he brings up and really leans into this quote unquote character, which I think is a very real part of himself, in order to try to show people what he thinks is wrong out there in the world. And that makes a ton of sense. So we can all look at the way he does this and think it's despicable. The, the, you know, he wears controversial t-shirts and uh, he says enormously controversial things and I'm not justifying any of it. I'm just saying that in his head, Maybe that's what he's trying to do. Because now we know that he tries to make it hurt or make an impact. Now we know that he's comparing the way he goes into a lot of these meetings as Sasha Baron Cohen playing a character to get a rise out of people, to show people what's wrong with society. So when we start putting these together, we start to understand what his motive is, what he's trying to do. I'm ending all wars. 
How? 2024, we ended all wars. Because wars... But how war, do you end wars? wars? Don't just say end wars. You gotta, you gotta have real Because tactic. war is made off of greed and deceit. And economy as well. Economy. But there is a free economy that the world has created for us that needs to be simplified by me. I am the visionary. I can end war. Don't just say that. Give me, if you were the presidential candidate, what would you say? How would you end it? You know, the biggest thing is I can see things. I live 20 years ahead. Everything I do is like some, someone would do. As you should. 20 years ahead, right. right? So it's laying out the plans. The same way how I lay out. I laid out the blueprint for blueprint. But you got to give us a layman. You're going to be speaking to constituents that Here, don't understand here's a, anything. Here's, here's the rap language. I made the blueprint for blueprint. I made the blueprint for blueprint right. as a vessel of God. Not me. God is actually the only artist. This is the thing. God runs the world. In this situation, we came up with the idea of not like, oh, DEFCON 3, but hey, I'm jealous of the Jewish people. Why? Okay. What? What did he just, what did he just say? Was there, was, there was no answer to that. So, wow. Uh, first of all, DJFN, again, major props. He's staying on him. Like he's going, you didn't answer my question. Answer my question. You didn't answer my question. By the way, this goes on for a while. Like we're looking at what short segment of him trying to get out of him. Like, cause he's talking about, you know, running for office and he's saying like, how would you do it? So let's look at right in the beginning when he asks him for the first time in this clip. Uh, so I believe that Ye has no answer for this. He doesn't know and he knows he doesn't know. And he's trying to figure out how to get out of this. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing here because if we look at this entire interview, three hours and 20 some minutes, we see very little face touching from Ye. And face touching is something we often associate to high stress. Of course it could happen with something else. You have an itch, you know, or you just, just because. And not only do we see face touching, but we see, so we see this and we see some mouth blocking. The hand comes in front of the mouth. And this is something that we have in our behavior ever since we're children. When we don't want to say something or say something we don't want to say, what do we do? Hands come up. You see this in kids all the time. As adults, we get better at it, but here we see that mouth block. I think this might be associated with subconscious. He's thinking like, I don't, I don't know what to say here. I have no idea what to say. Then we see this stroking here, which is consistent with pacifying or a self-soothing gesture. These are gestures we make to calm ourselves down. And we're seeing that right there. This is not very common for him. So we see it right there. I think he's self-soothing, he's thinking. You know, sometimes we self-soothe when we think about something, he's trying to come up with an answer and he comes up with nothing. He just rambles. Uh, we get a bunch of fluff. We get non-answer statements, one after the other. He's asking, how would you stop war? And he goes, see, because war is made of greed and deceit. Okay, is that, so then he goes back, give a how, like don't say that, give me a how. And then he goes up this, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the blueprint of the blue, like what? What are you saying? So this is, I think, once again, just this going back to this Messiah complex. Like he thinks he's as effective a politician as any politician out there. He thinks he's as effective a comedian as Sasha Baron Cohen. Because he's excelled at so many things in his life, I think he's developed a mentality of like, there's nothing he can't do. But this is evidence that like, you can't, you know, politics is just not really, at least not for now, your thing. It's also worth mentioning that this show is called Drink Champs. And if you look on that table, there's about 80 bottles of a thousand different things. And there was also weed. So, you know, at this point in the interview, it, we're getting towards the end. They're under the influence of stuff. So, you know, could it be that if he wasn't, he would have a better answer for that. And he's just rambling about blueprint of blueprint because he's under the influence of things. Yeah it's consistent with that kind of behavior, just kind of rambling about nonsense, not really understanding the question, just talking about it. It's very possible. You know, I had one more clip in, in my clips that I wanted to look at, but it goes back to the, one of the very controversial topics. And at that point, there's too much alcohol involved and it's really not that coherent. So I think I'll just leave it out. You know, I think we had some great stuff here that allows us to know whether it's the words he was saying or the body language, what's going on in his head? What is he trying to do? He's extremely ineffective at it. He says things in ways that are very triggering and I think it goes back to the fact that in his head, some of it makes sense. He thinks he's doing one thing, but he's doing something totally different. 
But there it was, a lot of interesting conversations to be had in the comments. I look forward to some of your feedback and what you think of this. There's a lot going on here and I really wanna know what you guys think of this. Is this just the character he's leaning into? And, but then again, that doesn't excuse any of it. Like if you're playing a character, it doesn't excuse any of it. So my bottom line, if it wasn't clear in the video, is this. I think he does have a very grand vision of himself that what he says is always right and what he thinks is always right. And I think he does things to get a reaction out of people. I don't think that necessarily the intention always is to be offensive, but I also personally, personally, don't think that that matters. Because if your actions are offensive to the masses, to your own community, and, and people who have looked up to you, people who have supported you, people who love you, people you love, are looking at you and feel betrayed, feel hurt, I don't think there's any justification for that. You know you're being offensive, you're seeing the headlines. But ultimately, I think he needs help. I think he needs to talk to someone who could say, listen, here's what you're doing. It may not be your intention, but here's what you're doing. And here's how it's hurting people that you yourself care about. Um, and I think he needs to really look inwards. And I honestly think that there was a, a moment there where they got him to think inwards and they were chipping at it. So as much as they're getting heat and criticism for this, I was really impressed by their interviewing style and the fact that they let him get it out there and then eventually started chipping away at it. I don't think that the internet should be that hard on, on the hosts of the show. I thought they did a very good job in a lot of places. Uh, but ultimately, I can't wait to hear from you. Honestly, I'm really excited to read the comments on this one because I do think there's going to be some differing opinions on what's going on with this guy. Like, how bad is it? And I look forward to hearing your opinion on that. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know what you thought in the comments and I will see you on the next one.